So I was actually talking about this last night with some of my coworkers about the decriminalization of many of the drugs in Oregon. Oregon is, of course, the first U.S. state to uh, decriminalize the possession of hard drugs. I think it was like heroin, cocaine, marijuana were some of the drugs that were decriminalized. As it says here, cannabis, like I said, cannabis was one of them. And I just talk about my perspective with my patient from last night. So one of the patients that I was taking care of last night was a drug-seeking patient. I've taken care of many different drug-seeking patients. And so from my perspective, what is the, what is the cost from the healthcare perspective, right? So I'll give you an example. So yesterday, actually the night before, I walk into my patient's room and the patient refused to have their blood drawn because they came in uh, for a particular reason that required them the need to have, to have their blood drawn to see if the person needed a transfusion. So then during the daytime, the person refused, right? Many of these individuals come into the hospital and typically because usually it's because of overdose of some form, they will either make their way to a step down floor or to a ICU, depending upon the stability of the patient. For the most part, unless that person is like overwhelmingly lethargic and possibly of needed of intubation, they will more than likely go to a step down floor. Now it's, all, it's also important to understand the different floors and diff, you know typically have different costs associated. Like an ICU bed costs more than, for example, like a, a step down bed. A surgical bed will cost more than certain beds within the hospital because of the procedures that are typically required for those patients. The type of monitoring, like patients that might require like telemetry monitoring, etc. So different diagnoses typically have like a, they're like packaged, right? So, you know, coming in for like, for example, GI bleed that the person might need certain procedures, right? So that's kind of like packaged into the cost. And so with someone who comes into the floor for like drug overdose or drug seeking, or like people who come in and someone might come in for cardiac, someone might come in for heart related issue where they're having like chest pain. And it could be a young person and I've gotten a report and the person's like 40, 50 years old and they have like an ejection fraction of like 20. And as soon as I hear the report, I'm like, oh, cocaine? Yeah, cocaine. Probably substance abuse, right? So the, a lot of times these individuals are non-compliant. It's very important to understand it's your tax dollars that are paying for these individuals to sit in the hospital to take up that bed that could be given to someone else. Hospitals have no incentive for saving the taxpayer money. There's literally no incentive for hospitals to try to save you the taxpayer money in any way, shape, or form. And so what typically what you'll see is these individuals will come in. And so my patient is like, I came to check your vitals and the patient, the person will refuse. Oh, like I'm in pain. Uh, you, you, I'm not getting the type of pain medication I need. I'd be like, well, I can get you some Tylenol. You want some Tylenol? No, I don't want, I don't want Tylenol. That doesn't do it for me. And they were like, well, they'll step them up, right? They'll offer them different medications and they'll just keep on refusing. They're like, no, that doesn't work for me. Or I'm allergic to that or, or, you know, that's not going to help me, et cetera. And what really what they want are narcotics. They're looking for things like morphine and Dilaudid, typically what most of these patients are seeking. And so what happens is these patients will subsequently then just become non-compliant. They will come to the hospital for whatever reason. Maybe they were found like strung out on the floor and somebody called 911. The person comes to the hospital, they get a little bit of fluid, they give them some Narcan, they start to wake up, et cetera. And so as the person for whatever reason that they come in for, they'll just be like, well, I'm not, I don't want you to take my blood pressure. I'm not letting you draw my blood. If you want me to do something for you, well, then you got to do something for me. And this is literally what happens. This is literally what happened yesterday and the night, and the night before with my patient, where the patient just becomes non-compliant. Or maybe there's like a procedure for like, if you have to like, for example, administer blood, maybe the person came in for like overdose, they have GI bleed. And so 
you're in the middle, you're literally about to give blood, and that person will be like, you know what? Nah. I'm not, I'm not doing this until you give me something for pain. And so, in essence, the person becomes manipula manipulative and only becomes compliant after they negotiate and get, of course, their narcotic of choice. And this typically happens. I always thought for quite some, when I, when I worked at Elmhurst Hospital, there was always like this paying attention to drug seekers and every, doing everything possible not to give patients narcotics. It's just outward refusal of, non, of not getting, giving these individuals narcotics, and then they would leave. And, that, and maybe, maybe it was because it was a city hospital. Maybe that's why. But this is typically what I see. So when I think of places like Oregon, I mean, just like this morning, I, on the weekends that I work, on, when I come home on Sunday, I have to take the railroad home. Otherwise, I have to take the regular train and it takes way too long for me to get home on a Sunday. So I take the railroad. It leaves me off right here at Harlem and 125th. And when you get off at Harlem and 125th on a Sunday morning, it is a sea of homeless drug addicts on all up and down 125th. And not too far over on like 1st and 2nd Avenue by 125th, there are multiple methadone, there are multiple methadone clinics. And so what you end up with is a lot of these people that are just like walking around like zombies because they're strung out on methadone. They take their methadone and then they go out and do drugs. I used to have see patients like this when I did home care. There was a lady that I took care of who, who was like a diabetic bilateral amputee. She had both of her legs amputated because she was not compliant with her diabetes. And on top of that, she was in a wheelchair and she was not compliant with just simple, simple repositioning. She became non-compliant about repositioning, ended up developing um, pressure ulcers under her, like under her butt area. And of course, I was coming in to do the dressing changes and she would just become non-compliant. She was also a methadone patient. And so when I would, and so on Fridays, they give them their, their methadone for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So when I would walk in on that Monday morning, she would be strung out on methadone. Impossible to wake up. And of course, a lot of this is paid for via taxes because this goes from, this was when I was, this was back when I was doing some home care. I worked for home care for about two years here in Manhattan. And I saw a lot of these patients uptown. Of course, some patients you get, some of these patients are, are t on the poorer side, um, typically minorities, and some of them are quite compliant. But then you get quite a number of them that are just non-compliant. And so what, this, is what Oreg this is basically what Oregon is going to end up with. They're going to end up with a string of people who will end up becoming addicted to these drugs and then of course they'll just end up with methadone clinics you know popping up around Oregon because that's literally what I, that's literally what I would do in any state that decriminalizes the use of drugs I would just open a methadone clinic and you would just rake it in you would literally be farming you would literally be farming these people for their addiction and so short sure, many of these individuals you know there's the misconception that these people are doing you know, the war on drugs and that a lot of these people are just getting dragged in and thrown into jail because they were smoking weed, which isn't the case. You get thrown into jail for possession, not for medicinal use. And so for many of these individuals, this is typically what you're going to end up seeing. You're going to end up seeing a lot of these people end up strung out. The same thing that I see right here on Harlem on 125th every other Sunday when I get off of when I get off of the railroad. And this is this is typically what I see. It, it's a sea, literally, especially in the summertime especially in the summertime right there, Lexington Avenue, 125th, it is a sea of mental health and drug addiction. And that is what mostly, I, I, thankfully, I live way further down. I take the sixth train all the way downtown. But I could just imagine for many of these black and Hispanics that live in that neighborhood, and this is what they see every single day that they live in that neighborhood. They just see, and mo of course, most of these individuals are, are homeless. Eventually, they make their way into the hospital because they overdose on the street and then they come into the hospital. They get, they get a little bit of medication. They become non-pliant. They leave AMA and then they just come right back. They come right back around. And so I wouldn't care for me as a nurse. I've been a nurse eight years. I wouldn't care if, if you decided to just not, not criminal, you know, decriminalize all these things. You weren't going to spend the money on you know, putting, arresting these people and, and putting them in jail and doing rehab, etc., if they actually just let the consequences of these people's actions go to the limit, 
I see the I see the exact same thing with alcoholism. The revolving door of patients that come into the hospital setting for alcoholism. They'll come in. Two weeks later, they come in. I have you know eighteen beers a day, or I drink a liter of vodka a day. And typically, typically most of those are men. That that I've a lot of them that I've seen, and they come in every month, every other month. And this is what you pay for as the taxpayer, right? There was a patient that we had a couple of months back that there was an article, there was an article written about this person like 10 years prior, 10 years prior to that day. Cause I remember one of the nurses recognized the patient from an article that she read like a long time ago. And she's like, Oh, I know who that person is. Ends up showing us, you know, online that this person like 10 or 15 years ago racked up a $3 million medical bill. And of course that is paid for by the taxpayer. And so the way that that individual would skirt the law in which many of, and in which is how many of them end up in the hospital is they just complain of chest pain. And that's how they end up in the hospital. They end up in the hospital, they complain of chest pain. And most of these individuals do have cardiac problems because they use drugs. And typically many of the drugs that they use like cocaine typically affects your heart. And so many of these individuals will come in and they'll just be like, oh, the patient has an elevated troponin, which is a cardiac enzyme. When you have heart damage, the patient will be admitted to the hospital and then they'll stay there for a few days and then they just leave AMA and they just rinse and repeat. And of course the hospital gets paid, staff members get paid, but it's you, the taxpayer, that ends up taking the L because all that, all that money gets wasted because a lot of that money, I remember back when I used to do home care and a lot of times there were like a lot of elderly patients that were like a little bit off, but they wanted to stay in the home. They didn't want to go to a nursing home and I couldn't get them an aid for the, for the life of me. I could not get many of these individuals who were ball precautions or had poor eyesight. And unfortunately, a lot of that money that goes wasted on many of these individuals who get themselves addicted to drugs and while it, while drug addiction is a disease, many of these individuals made the initial choice to take these to take these medications, fully knowing that they would that that the risk is that they would end up being addicted to them, and that's just that's just a reality. Many of these individuals, despite eventually becoming addicted to these drugs, just like people become addicted to opioids, many end up going in that direction by choice, and and unfortunately end up becoming becoming addicted. And this, of course, will only get worse. But I can just imagine over the next couple over the next couple of months and years that the inhabitants of Oregon will regret will regret this decision as they see more and more of their neighbors who maybe wouldn't want to do drugs for whatever reason because they wouldn't want to get arrested. The, the stigma they'll realize. I, I can get I can get away with it. I can just do it. It's not a problem. It's not that big a deal anymore, because it gets downplayed. The side effects. Not I shouldn't say the side effects, but I should say more like the consequences of their actions get downplayed, and many individuals will take this the wrong way. The decriminalization will be viewed typically by blacks and Hispanics the wrong way, and will lead many astray.